next up here, uh, we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Adrian Meyer. So making sure we're all ready to go on that. Uh, excellent. Uh, so uh, a little bit about Adrian Meyer here. Uh, he is... Um, a data scientist for remote sensing and machine learning at the Institute Geomatics. I can't even pronounce that part. I'm not going to lie. I don't speak um, <laughs> that, that language. <laughs> and currently working on several big projects, mainly focusing on automated image analysis, uh, telemetry, big data processing, deep learning, digital reconstruction. Holy moly, this guy does a lot. And he's interested at uh, the interest of the animal biologist by training mature during uh, analysis of geotagged wildlife imagery in Cape Town, South Africa. Man, you 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 got some uh, you got some serious uh, nerd shops there. Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks for joining us. Where are you joining us from? Uh, thanks for the awesome introduction. Um, I'm joining today from uh, Basel. That's uh, or actually from the little suburb of Basel called Mutens, uh, which is where our more or less unpronounceable school is <laughs> situated. How do you um, pronounce that? Because I... I, I <laughs> the, um, the Fachhochschule Nordwestschweiz. <laughs> Bless you. <It's>, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, see, you can do that. That's uh, among your various skills, you can pronounce that. That is awesome. I, 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 um, I, I, I must learn your ways. Uh, so I will turn this over to you. Um, and uh, it looks like you're going to be uh, talking about uh, something that is completely blocked on my screen here. <laughs> oh, come on, Zoom, get out of the way. <laughs> and analyzing solar panels in Switzerland using aerial imagery. So uh, awesome. So I'm going to turn this over to you and um, go for it. OK, perfect. I'm going to try to do the screen share thing here. Okay. Well, um, thank you everyone for being part here, for uh, being interested, for um, wanting to listen to, to this talk. It's, it's going to be um, about a specific application case of uh, detecting and analyzing solar panels. Um, this is a type of big data um, problem that we have been working on since about two years now um, at the Institute of Geomatics of the um, University of Applied Sciences in Northwestern Switzerland, which would be the appropriate translation for the, for the German term. Um, I'm not working alone on this. We actually uh, have a couple of student projects uh, going on here. And uh, my two professors, Duny Jordan and Martin Christen, of, um, who many of you probably know, they also uh, join in this project. And we perform it together with the um, government of Switzerland, more sp um, precisely the Federal Office for Energy. They are interested in the amount of solar energy installed in Switzerland and the energy department of the Canton Aargau, Martin Hertach and Peter Barmet are our um, two project partners. Uh, the Federal Office for Energy in Switzerland has released already a map of all the roofs of Switzerland. So they do know where the buildings are and they do know how steep the roofs are and everything like that. Um, and they made this awesome map here to the right, uh, which is basically um, a type of cadastre system where you can find out how much potential for solar energy usage your roof or the roof of your neighbor has. And they incorporated relatively complex roof geometries, I would say, um, like uh, level LOD2. And uh, you can see, you can click on a, on a single shape here and it's going to give you uh, the suitability estimate, the roof area, and also how much uh, Swiss francs you can earn um, by installing panels there. So this is the side of like installing new panels. What they, um, what they do not know yet is uh, how many panels there are. So we have this data set is based on the Swiss Buildings 3D data set from the official office um, Swiss Topo, um, the topographical office of Switzerland. Um, 
the, the roof shapes are incorporated. And what we also have of the same office is the aerial imagery. So we have um, 10 centimeter ground resolution, which is the newest data set and 25 centimeter ground resolution, um, which results in about uncompressed 200 megabytes per square kilometer. And we also got uh, PNG tiles that uh, you can take out of this, which we use for our machine learning approach by uh, one megapixel and they result to two to three megabytes as PNG. So we have this, we have the aerial imagery, we have the vector data, we have the roof size and the solar potential. Um, we know that there are around 2 million buildings in Switzerland, which could incorporate solar power, but what we don't have is the location of each system. We don't have a size and we don't have the type of solar panels. They know some, the Federal Office for Energy knows some because of um, government subventions like uh, um, money plans paid out for the owners of these panels, um, but uh, it's far from complete. So this is what this project is about, getting a complete idea. We're not the first ones doing something similar. This was uh, from Stanford, a deep solar project in 2018. They um, already used a type of segmentation AI system um, based on Google Maps imagery, which has a much more coarse resolution than the 10 centimeters, or at least back then had a much more coarse resolution than the 10 centimeters we are working on. So we are really trying to figure out now how far we can get this. Um, to get these um, common types of object detection, which most of you will be familiar with, you can classify the whole image, you can localize an object within the image, you can uh, detect the objects and instantiate them. So ideally knowing how many cats there are in a picture, or you can do the most difficult approach like finding the actual shapes. Um, my work here uh, is based on a project I did in 2017 where I detected wildlife on, um, on aerial images uh, done by a thermal infrared camera. And I used TensorFlow back then really successfully to, to arrive at a detector that can in real time like identify certain animal species on, on thermal sensors. So we thought, okay, let's, let's use this. Let's use the faster RCNN approach uh, for, um, as an initial um, base uh, to find out where these panels are on our tiles from the all, all of Switzerland. You guys are very welcome to try this type um, of analysis out yourself. I made a little tutorial notebook about this uh, on Google Colab. I can, uh, I can show you quickly uh, on, in a browser how it's going to look like. Um, the link is here. So this is um, this Google Colab. There's uh, all the code is documented. Make sure when you execute it that you first downgrade um, downgrade NumPy out of compatibility reason because this code is already a bit older than a year. Um, and then you have to restart the notebook and it should run completely through it, downloads the data set. And then you can actually run a little solar detector for yourself. And okay, so it, it's gonna throw you this error, but there's, there's no problem with it. You just click restart runtime, say yes, and then you can redo it. So this is um, this would be that, and it's going to result not with quite because it's preset with only three thousand steps learning and to not take up too much of time. Well, it's going to result with some similar images, and what what we got out of taking this code then was um, with pretty high accuracy already finding out where panels are, not uh, not the precise shape, but where they are. So, okay, this is not exactly yet what the federal office wanted, but it's, it's already going in the right direction. No? Um, what we could use it for then, because the average precision for photovoltaic systems was actually really high with about 92%. And for thermal, it was like about 62% because a lot of them were detected as photovoltaics. They tend to be a bit smaller, they're a bit harder to detect, they have a higher heterogeneity. 
So we thought, okay, we go for a multi-layered workflow. We split our data set into these tiles. We use faster, identity, uh, faster RCNN to identify the tiles. And then we um, wanted to start a workshop where a few professional experts, they actually uh, label the concrete geometries of this. Uh, so subsequently, we can try and mask RCNN to find the actual geometries. Um, I'm gonna run you through this. You don't have to look at it now in too much detail um, because we have actually nice images for this. The mask RCNN, a lot of you might be familiar with this. Um, I think Metaport started it a couple of years ago. Uh, it's actually quite a recent technology to find out precise segments of objects. It's an extension of the faster RCNN. So it's uh, similar deep learning. Um, but it's based on masks, like the name suggests. So we had to generate these masks somehow. And not only that, we, we can't just do, okay, this is all photovoltaics, the red one here, and the green one is not, for example, those would be roof windows. I know they, they look pretty close. We also need to instantiate them. Instantiation means like in, in the image, we need to um, give each of them a single ID, each system that is separate from another. So we actually know how many there are and we can form concrete geometries. Um, last year, EuroPython, we had a short code sprint there, um, where there was a, a lot of cool input and then we programmed a small uh, cloud contribution client also from the input that came out from the code sprint where um, people can actually label the data. This was very specifically for a project. So it's a bit hard to take this over to, to another project. Um, then we did a workshop. We invited a, a couple of trained people and let them label a bit more than 30,000 polygons on the eight, more or less 8,000 image tiles. They are not very evenly distributed throughout Switzerland, like because we had a much better databases uh, from our project partners in Argau. We had more there. Argau is like one of the cantons of Switzerland. Um, but we also took some higher densities, um, population density cities outside of that area to, to get labels. I'm not gonna run <laughs> through all of these 8,000 images with you. This is just two examples. How it's, how it's looking like um, solar panels are uh, a relatively good thing to label because they in general don't have extremely complex geometry. So there's a lot of 90 degree angles so it's easy to do it with pointing. Other objects you might have to do with a brush type of tool. Here you can just digitalize them or digitize them. And then we generated the masks. Um, the, all the elements are instantiated as colors uh, on PNG images that have a fairly small size that fit exactly over the aerial imagery tiles. Um, you can see what the labels look like. So we have a lot of systems, solar systems that are actually smaller than 10 square meters. So um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that on one roof, there's only 10 square, uh, square meters of solar panels. There might be multiple rows of 10 square meter solar panels, but then generally most connected panels are rather in the smaller section. So um, they would fit on one of our tiles. And the question is, okay, we get implementations for both, for PyTorch and for TensorFlow. I'm sure, there are a couple of others, but there we have um, a great support from the community from these two, and we know that there are examples using Mask RCNN. And uh, we thought we were going for PyTorch. As, uh, you, a lot of you might be familiar with the library. It's got quite a Pythonic interface. It's got a GPU support. Um, and a nice NumPy Torch Tensor Bridge. Uh, you get a lot of pre-trained models which are available. Torch Vision, you can try out multiple optimizers uh, with a fairly straightforward approach. You can see it how the learning rate scheduler here is optimized with just a few variables and the weight decay of the optimizer can, can be set manually or can be programmed easily in Python. So this is a, this is a, gr a great approach. And we had one of our students, uh, Samuel Stamm, try this out in 2019, um, also using Google Colab on avalanche de early detection. 
Uh, it was working quite well. We, we were actually surprised ourselves. So this is, uh, this is like webcam imagery from, uh, from the Alps. And the, the red ones are detections which could result later in an avalanche and the green ones are um, faults that do not uh, necessarily become an avalanche. So this was uh, one of these projects that led to us thinking, okay, this is actually quite a cool technology to use here. Um, we set up our own uh, high performance computing system, which is a um, 48 core CPU system with a lot of RAM and a, a lot of memory. But most importantly, the four high-speed uh, graphic cards, the GPU units with a lot of CUDA cores that you need to have efficient training running here. Um, our front end is a JupyterHub system, which is um, phenomenal. It's really great. Uh, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> it, it offers a terminal, Unix terminal right out of the browser and you can, um, it can run while you leave the computer. So this is great. For machine learning, you don't have to have your own laptop clogged up or running, uh, revving really high at home. So a server-sided solution is really the way to go for also these amounts of data sets that we are dealing with here. Um, we have quite a, um, we, we used the Torch Utils um, data data set uh, option to try out uh, some data parallelism. This is, uh, is not, exactly easy to implement, but it's possible. So mm, we don't have really provided examples for the um, parallel multi-GPU system, but um, we figured out um, through uh, try and error to, to use multi-GPU support here. Um, here. You can see how we instantiate the PNG images, the object, object masks, the label masks, those are all um, predefined data sets that we can just uh, use out of uh, provided examples. And um, this would be the loss graph uh, for one of our runs where we did the whole data set of the 30,000 polygons. And you can see like at around the six uh, epoch, it's not, um, it's not really uh, getting any better anymore, the models. We're using a ResNet 50 here, and it was about expected that it needs about this time. We achieved this after about two hours of training or something like that, plus minus. And uh, here's some preliminary results where you can see where we're going for. So uh, we realized when you see the differences in the precision value here in the segments between using all the categories like um, photovoltaic thermals and other panels um, together in one group, the precision increases, increases dramatically compared to when you try to have the mask RCNN set up that it would differentiate them by, the, by itself already. So what we see here is that we have really high, more than 80% uh, precision running in a single class paradigm. So this was the way to go for us. Uh, you can see also that is uh, running relatively smoothly because the uh, uh, dependence between the precision and the recall is rather linear. It's, um, it's, actually, it's actually okay to use as an approach. Some examples um, qualitatively how it looks like. Um, the, the masks turn out really well. There's not too much uh, spill over or under. There's obviously still some problems. There's roof windows that look like solar panels or there's like these gray structures that have absolutely the same shape as uh, newer panels that are more black and white and reflect the sunlight in a gray matter. So there's the challenges. Um, also the small ones didn't do too, too well. The ones um, below three square meters, but when we cleared them out of the data set, the, um, the precision or the recall wouldn't drastically increase. So we thought we'd rather keep them in. Um, we want to go over our labels again, like there's a bit problems with reflections. Uh, uh, sometimes labels were created. This is just a, a, a playground slide here. This is like a bitumen roof, uh, tar roof or some things like that. They look very, very similar to solar panels. So we have to um, clean these up still. This is uh, still quite some manual work. There's also some complete labeling mistakes in between. But I think with uh, scales like that, it's relatively normal. 
So we have a computational load for a single run inferencing all these images over the complete of Switzerland, which is 4 million images. Um, and each uh, image would take on the, on the CPU cores 2.1 seconds of inferencing and using the parallelized GPUs one second, which is still resulting with 46 days of inferencing, um, a bit too much. To be honest, this is uh, the we are running into really big data problems here, and we figured out that the one big reason um, why this is still taking so long is the I/O, the input-output operations between the between the hard drives and and the GPU. This is actually more something about job scheduling, what we're dealing with here. So we figured out uh, a job queue approach uh, through MongoDB, NoSQL database, where um, where all the detections, <laughs> thank you, where all the detections get um, um, run on more or less unlimited processes that just uh, get thrown onto the GPUs one after another, and then written into into the database. Mm. This uh, worked really well as an approach, and we are currently inferencing the whole country on around plus minus 10 days. There's still potential by optimizing the model, and we could um, reduce the inferencing times maybe by use, using a different model, but that would require probably using TensorFlow since we don't want to really develop a new mask R CNN approach for ResNet 101 or something for, for PyTorch. And shifting the whole architecture is a bit of a um, problem right now. So we're not we're probably not doing this, but rather optimize the model that we have. And it's not too bad, the 10 days. That's like a more realistic uh, thing. And we are running this currently. It's taking about another two days. And then the first uh, complete uh, Switzerland-wide data set will be available. Um, so um, another option would be to use hybrid CPU, GPU systems, or so to load the CPUs as well with processes uh, for inferencing. And uh, there is actually still, uh, we can see the wattage of the GPUs here, of the four Tesla GPUs and the memory used. This is not actually running at its full capacity at all. So we are still bottlenecking at the data, uh, database level and getting the data sets in uh, the actual inferencing takes probably really quick and we could still scale this up um, and optimize for a higher GPU load. Um, I already mentioned this slightly that we want to try out maybe ResNet 101 or there's also this um, new ResNet plus Inception V2 mask RCNN approach. Uh, but since we don't wanna like start this whole up ourselves on PyTorch, we either have to wait a little bit here for the community or just try it out in TensorFlow anyway. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not wizardry. It's cool, but it's not wizardry. Um, obviously, some more manual labeling um, would be always great, like more data is always better in our times, isn't it? Uh, but we also have some post-classification strategies which might render the other, um, other things like uh, superfluous. Like we have this um, post classification workflow now set up where we run multiple models for inferencing, like with multiple optimizers, with multiple um, with multiple presets, um, or different uh, different data set handling, and different uh, tiles cut, like uh, a shift in the tiles, and then we want to um, do a heuristic analysis on which pixel is actually with which probability by multiple models uh, used. Mm. Uh, also, including the near infrared data as an option, there you can see a map of a 10 centimeter coverage uh, that is currently available. So this would fit well with our multi uh, multi model and the heuristic analysis. And in the end, we could drop this all into a random forest classifier together with cadaster data, um, GIS attributes uh, like. Um, there, there are a lot of big statistics data sets, area statistic data sets in Switzerland available that uh, we could use for this type of approach. And then we would possibly additionally run an exception model, like a classification approach on the tiles, on, 
on the actual masks that we have identified already as having solar panels in order to figure out which type it is. Is it thermal or is it photovoltaic? Okay, that would be the end. Uh, I'll give you this little <laughs> goodie picture for the end. Uh, so, um, just uh, underlining that also humans sometimes have difficulties telling things apart that look very alike. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So I actually do have a couple of questions in here for you. Um, so yeah, I love the dog and muffin scenario. That's, that's, that's crazy. Okay, so yeah, I've, I've got a couple of good questions here. Uh, so um, Bahish um, Yusef, I hope I'm not butchering that name, uh, said, can you not get some of this information, location of PV panels type, et cetera, from local distribution network operators? Mm. Yeah, um, this is true, and uh, this is what we uh, what we based some of our uh, data sets actually on. Like, uh, but we only have like a really consistent data set for this for the Canton of Argau, which covers a, a small part of Switzerland. And the whole idea of the project was to have like a consistent data set over the whole of Switzerland. Um, there are data sets where there's rough point location more or less for for uh, larger photovoltaic systems but for the small private ones at home um, or smaller they still might cover more than 10 square meters but uh, there the data is not uh, there yet especially not when it comes to um, the actual shape all right and then uh, i think we have time for one uh, hopefully one more maybe both um, okay, so um, anonymous uh, person asks, uh, there are a lot of different solutions to detect PV based on satellite images and more are coming. What is the state of art and why are there still various companies working on new solutions? Um, yeah, I, I think actually uh, it, it depends largely on the uh, amount of or the, the type of input data that you have. There are quite various approaches to do this, but I think it crystallizes out in a moment that machine learning at least is, is the way to go. There, there have been um, uh, approaches in the past of uh, using more like pixel-based analysis or OBIA, these types of approaches, um, but it, tends that, it turns out that at the moment, probably using segmentation-based deep learning is the state of the art. Um, maybe using these multi-parted approaches, uh, like having actually multiple parallel deep learning networks can increase the reliability of these types of analysis. So we are hoping that we are at the state of the art <laughs> <laughs> by doing that. Excellent. And actually, I think I can get this last one in. So uh, Simon asks, it was mentioned that a mask RCNN was trained in about two hours with a ResNet 50 backbone on the mentioned hardware. Was the training done with transfer learning or training from scratch? Uh, yeah, we do use transfer learning because we still think, although we have 8,000 images, our data set is not large enough to start from scratch. Um, Transfer learning is uh, is much easier to implement, and uh, you, you have a lot of um, a lot of support by the community. You have a lot of experience that is already around, and uh, quite frankly, the the, the pre-trained models they they are just better on a lot of things than uh, doing it from scratch, as from from our experience. So yeah, we did use um, transfer learning. And we started with Coco pre-trained. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Adrian. <laughs> so if anyone has any other questions for uh, Adrian. Uh...